It is exceptionally good to be with you, and thank you too uh, for your welcome, at least tacitly, by not getting up and walking out the door. As you've heard, uh, my job is to run the Vicar Factory in Durham. We have a secret institution just in the shadow of Durham Cathedral, and every year we take 30 or 35 perfectly ordinary people into uh, the walls of the institution, and two or three years later they come out, well, like Matthew, really. <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. They come in ordinary, they leave saying, the Lord be with you. <laughs> I, I jest, of course, it is an extraordinary privilege. And I'm grateful for your prayers. It's a very challenging time in the uh, theological education sector, if you're aware of some of the things going on in General Synod. It's a time of change, good change, but nonetheless a time of change. Uh, this year we have 33 Anglicans or leaving uh, to be ordained deacon. And please do pray for them one of the things I often tell them is that the friendships they form at Theological College will be sustaining and life-giving uh, throughout uh, their ministry. And here today is an example of that. I think 17 years after both of us were ordained deacon in very different places, a clerical friendship which sustains and which is encouraging, at least to me. So thank you, Matthew, not just for your welcome today. Today is Vocation Sunday and we have three very different readings, so forgive me, I'm going to concentrate almost exclusively on one of them. Like Pooh Bear, I am a bear of very little brain and it helps me just to look in one direction at a time. So I want to take you back, if I may, to the reading from the book of Acts. Can you picture the scene, the story in Acts? Well, Acts has begun with Jesus saying, uh, wait until you're clothed with power from on high. He has ascended. We'll celebrate that in just a few days' time now. Then the day of Pentecost comes, which we'll celebrate in what, two or three weeks' time, I guess. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And this extraordinary, frightened bunch of northern fishermen, ill-educated, ill-cultured, find themselves literally on the world stage. The world has come to Jerusalem, people from every part of the known world. And Peter, Peter of all people, stands up and preaches, and people not only give him their attention, but they are persuaded. Acts chapter 2, at the end, we see thousands, 3,000 at that point, added to their number. Acts chapter 3, which comes before this reading, we see an extraordinary healing of a man who has been lame. And that's the furore where we pick the story up. Because basically, the authorities do not like it. And they have the apostles. Excuse me, I've got a very bad case of man flu, so it sounds like I'm coughing. It's because I'm trying not to. That's my daughter's diagnosis, by the way. It really helps to have sympathetic children in the house. Um, where was I? I was saying, yes, here they are. The authorities do not like it, and they basically have the apostles on trial. And as I read that story in preparation for today, a profound question occurred to me, the kind of question that maybe only occurs to those of us in theological colleges. Would you like me to share it with you just for a moment? It's this. What on earth would their mums have thought of them on that day? I mean, let's just be real. Here are perfectly ordinary Galilean fishermen, salt of the earth types. They grew up knowing exactly what they were going to do. And now here they are causing a stink that has the highest authorities in the land wanting to haul them over the coals. What are their mums going to think? They thought they had done so well. And of course, in that society, where as a boy you did what your father had done and what your grandfather had done before him, particularly in a fishing community where there was so much tackle, quite literally, that you needed to possess, this would have come completely out of the blue. And those who knew them well would have thought, what on earth has happened? I got quite distracted by this question. And I just imagine the mum sitting there sipping a cup of tea or whatever they drank in first century Palestine. They've been such nice boys after all. Well, as nice boys as fishermen boys ever are. They got into a few scraps, but they've been decent sorts. In fact, everything had been all right until that travelling rabbi came along. Oh, people either loved him or hate him, but they assumed that his inner circle had it all easy. After all, there were the stories of healings and the stories of feeding of 5,000 and 4,000. Surely it was wonderful, but actually... When I think about my boy Peter following him, I'll tell you it was nothing like that at all. I'll tell you of the arguments and the disagreements they had. I'll tell you about the confusion when they didn't know which direction this Jesus, as they call him, wanted to go in. I'll tell you about the fear and the doubt, particularly when they dragged this Jesus off just a few weeks ago 
and nailed him to a cross like a common criminal. I thought it was over for my boy then. And like a sensible lad that he is, he went back to fishing. But then, then everything changed once again. People were saying that they'd seen this teacher alive. And my Peter changed absolutely. I could show you his school reports. But now, look at him. He is a different man. And how did he do that trick with the lame man? I never taught him anything like that. I'll tell you who I blame for this, his mum might have said. It's that Jesus fellow. When he came along and said, follow me, my Peter changed completely. Well, I'm reading between the line of all sorts of texts, but I don't think I'm very far from what Peter's mum might have said on this day, except maybe I've been a little harsh. For as a parent myself, as many of you will be, and if you're not, think of some children that you know, as you look at them and love them, you want the very best for them, even when you don't understand it. So maybe she wouldn't just have been embarrassed. Maybe she would have looked at him and said, I don't know where this has come from, but somehow as he stands up here, It seems to me that he's fulfilling his destiny in a way that I never truly thought possible. When Jesus called, something came into being which is absolutely right and yet completely unexpected. It comes back to Jesus' call. Or in Latin, because we're cultured people so we know a little bit of Latin, it is... Vocatio Jesu, or vocatio Jesu, depending how you pronounce it. This vocatio changes everything. This call and Peter's response to it radically transforms an ordinary man into an extraordinary man. Takes someone whose life was following a predictable path and makes a remarkable apostle out of them. Today is, as you have heard, Vocation Sunday. And it doesn't take a GCSE in Latin to link vocation and vocatio. They are the same words. Today is the day when we think about Jesus' call, which echoes not just in first century Palestine, but down through the ages in the church. And the real danger is that those of us who are sitting here wearing ordinary clothes, perhaps the equivalent of fishermen's clothes, will look at those of us who are dressed in poncy clothes at the front and think, that's fine, you talk about what Jesus has called you to. And thank the Lord that he has called people like Matthew into ordained service. But don't for a moment think that the call of God stops there. What about the people teaching our children at this very moment? Is that not a call of Christ? What about those who are ministering, doing the sound desk, or have worked in the office throughout the week? Is that not the call of Christ? Ordinary people called into extraordinary things. Yes, of course it is. But don't for a moment think that the call of Christ stops there. What about those among us who tomorrow morning will go out and care for the least and for the lowest and for the lost in our society? Social workers or teachers or police officers, those who work in the council or those who tend and care for creation. I don't know you well enough to be clever and name the jobs that you do, forgive me. But the truth is that the living spirit of Christ calls people that wherever we are, we seek to transform the world with the love of Christ that goes beyond anything we could ask or imagine. There are a few who have a vocation to ordained ministry. But I think of my father, 
whose vocation was very clearly to medicine. Retired now, but a paediatrician, a child doctor, throughout, as in a doctor to children, not a children child who is a doctor, uh, throughout his career. The love of Christ compels us to be faithful witnesses wherever we are. Just imagine for a moment that you're a teacher, just to choose one particularly fine profession among many. You can do things tomorrow by way of influencing and changing lives that Matthew, despite the fact that he is an excellent priest, could not begin to do because you're the right person in the right place at the right time. Just like I can guarantee that Matthew does all sorts of things that you would never dream of doing because he's slightly crazy and that's why we like him. The vocation is unique and it's not just for adults, it's for children and for the elderly, elderly adults as well, of course. Because it all follows Jesus' call to follow him. If you want the theological language, vocation, this call to exercise the ministry of Christ wherever we are, always follows discipleship. And Jesus is in the business of walking into ordinary places to meet with ordinary people and say, your life is good, but it's time that it became the best it could ever be. It's time that you and I sorted out your relationship with the living God. It's time that we put you on an eternal footing. It's time we sorted out those things which trap you and bind you and make you less than you know you should be. It's time, in short, that you followed me, following in that life of discipleship. For some among us, and forgive me just for speaking to some for a while, but that is kind of my job, it might well be that today there is a nascent or a birthing calling into some kind of public ministry in the church. There is no more exciting or indeed scary time to step into public ministry in the church. It might be that you're called to lay ministry, either licensed or not. I notice we've got somebody who is a lay reader here this morning. I'm sure would love to talk to you about that ministry, or indeed my own wife, Lindsay, who's sitting just down here who is a lay reader, who would love to talk to you about that type of ministry. It might be that some of you actually are feeling that you wish you were anywhere else because you've had going on in the back of your, well, is it mind or heart, this sense that God is prodding you to explore ordained ministry. And maybe today is the day when you just need to say, okay, Lord, I give up. I will ask the question. Either Matthew or I would love to talk to you about that. There's a long process of discernment. You don't need to get it right on your own. And a fantastic, although I say it myself, process of training. And of course, Cramner Hall is the best place to train in the country, but that's another story. All of us, when we face the challenge of vocation, find ourselves in the place where we say, but I cannot do this. Let's come back to our example of a teacher. How can you embody the love of Christ to that particular class, full of the particular characters that you know? Well, the truth is you can't in your own strength. But the clue to this transformation comes in verse 8 of the Acts passage. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, said to them, The Holy Spirit that Jesus had said, wait, because you will be clothed with power from on high, and then you will be sent. The Holy Spirit, who is referred to in the ordination services, where the bishop says to the ordinands, you cannot bear the weight of this calling in your own strength. So pray earnestly for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then we sing this lovely 7th century Latin hymn, Come Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, enlighten with perpetual fire. I'll sing it to you if it wouldn't drive you all from the building. No, the truth is, whatever your vocation, you can't do it in your own strength. But the one who calls is faithful and will always provide for the calling he has upon you. 
And what about if you're retired? What about if you're in that age where the world says, you've had your innings? I think the way that we treat older members of our society is so often shameful. I have to say to you that I think perhaps you have the biggest vocation of all among us. For we are learning as a society how to care for what is sometimes called the third age in a way that we never have had to before. Please, none of you is too young. None of you is too old. None of you is too black, too white, too clever, too stupid, too rich, too poor, too this, too that. For Jesus to sidle alongside you and say, come, follow me. What would your mum think? Well, she might be horrified. She might look at you and say, you were so respectable, what's happened to you? But actually the mum who knows and loves us best would also be astonished at what God can do in you. I can't tell you what your vocation is this morning. That's not my place. It's that spirit of God speaking within you, which you recognize. Well, John Wimber, a great Californian theologian of last century, the end of last century, always said, when God speaks, you know it in your knower. Let me encourage you that when God speaks, he also equips. And that when God speaks... Our task is to respond in order that we might do as St. John says in his letter that we read this morning and love the world in truth and action. I will loiter with godly intent at the end of the service. I will be delighted to talk with any or all of you in his name. Amen.